Y'all, I, I, I don't know what to do with myself some Sundays. Lord, I'm sitting there listening to Andy sing, listening to Fran sing, Marie's over here in these high notes, Joe's singing baritone. I'm just like, oh, man, just sitting there listening to them. You know, I've had so many people say over the years they'll come and they'll, they'll hear the music and they'll come for worship or they'll see uh, one of the songs online or something. And I I'm telling you, we got some of the most talented people in all of central Louisiana on this stage every Sunday morning. Y'all give them a hand. And I'm just thankful for their dedication. I'm telling you, because I throw all sorts of curveballs at them. Uh, this past week, like I said, I wasn't there this past Wednesday. Been under the weather, was having some skin issues. It, it was a whole, a whole thing. But they didn't even get to rehearse these songs. So uh, our rehearsal was right then. That's the first time that we went. Out. Now, we've, a couple of, of us have played those songs before, but poor Marie and Joe, they start to learn, look, this, uh, this bicycle, sometimes it ain't even got no pedals. We just coast it. <laughs> but they are so willing to just go with the flow. Y'all, pray for Miss Fran. She has been by my side for years. There are times where I don't even want to look over here at her because I know she's going to have that face. What is he doing right now? Good morning, my friends. Good morning. Look, today we are going to be looking at this final conclusion of Apostle Peter's sermon to the folks that were gathered around after that blessed day of Pentecost. And look, let me do a real quick recap for you. So Jesus had risen from the grave. He spent time with the apostles and his followers, and then he ascended to heaven. He promised them that the Holy Spirit would come to be their comfort, to be their guide. And he says, go back to Jerusalem and wait. And so they go back to Jerusalem and they wait. Ten, late, ten days later, the Holy Spirit falls down. It fell on the apostles and approximately 120 fellow believers that were present that day. They begin to speak in these languages that should have been unknown to them, but was known to the, follow, the Jews that had come in town for the feast and the celebration of Pentecost. Many were amazed that these guys could speak their own native tongue, and then there were others in the crowd that said, no, no, they drunk. That's the only reason they can do that. Now, Peter stands up and he begins telling them some of the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah from the book of Joel the prophet and from the Psalms of David. The whole crowd is just dumbfounded. They're amazed, even convicted, because they realize now that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Savior that they had long waited on. In the final scriptures last week, we find that many of the members of the crowd, they came up to Peter and to the other apostles and they said, brothers, what should we do? What should we do? We, we believe you. We hear what you've been saying in your sermon to us. What do we do? Tell us. And Peter gives them their answer in today's scripture. And we find out how the earliest members of the church treated each other. I want y'all to stand with me. I'm going to read through them real quick. Acts chapter 2, 38 through 47. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God 
and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Can you imagine a world like this? Can you imagine just living, you know, neck and neck with our fellow Christian brothers and sisters where we get to just spend time together? Where none of us really have a stake in anything other than, you know, how we should be caring for one another, especially those in need. Only thing we're worried about, serving God, serving other people. Look, I, I think in a way that today's sermon is going to kind of be one of those full circle type of messages. I'm, I'm going to give you the punchline here at the very beginning. When the Jews from out of town had witnessed this event where the believers in Jesus were baptized in the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit himself had let them have the ability to speak about the mighty works of God in the languages of the people that were from all over the known world. They were astonished by this. Looking back over the past few weeks, we've seen how some believed and were amazed and how some tried to rationalize all this stuff away or mock the apostles. Peter gives some powerful scriptural evidence. We've talked about it the past two weeks. He is giving that evidence to prove Jesus's validity, that he was the son of God, that he rose from the dead and that he is the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for. Again, the people present were so moved that many of them asked that same question. Brothers, what should we do? I want you to think about that this week. Brothers, what should we do? These people that are asking. And Peter answers again in verse 38 and 39. He says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. Look, this is the whole truth. This is it right here. If you've never been to this church or you've never been to any other church, if you are a believer and you want to share the gospel with someone, this is the easiest way to do it. You say, repent, be baptized. You'll be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have sins, I have sins, we all have sins. It's be like a show on Oprah. If you'll look under your chair, everyone, there's a sin for you, a sin for you. Everybody gets sins. We are not perfect creatures. Somebody say amen. amen. If you are perfect, I think you made it to the wrong place. Maybe we'll try down the street. There's a few churches left and right because there ain't no perfect people in here. Thankfully, you know, I, I don't know all the sins in your life and you don't know all the sins in my life. If we all knew each other's sins, we'd probably have a hard time looking at one another. Talk about there would be people, we, we think people act judgmental now. Can you imagine if everyone knew every single one of your sins, public or secret? God does and he loves us anyway. God looks at us differently. He tells us, yes, I see what you're doing. It's not a secret to me. You'll notice though that God says, change. I want to help you change. He's not saying I hate you, but he's saying, guess what? I see what you're doing. Change. You'll notice in the Bible, neither Jesus, Peter, or any of the other apostles say, you know, you just live your best life now. That's how you know Jesus. You have to get in the Jesus mindset. What is that? Well, it's, it's where, you know, we, we go and we meditate 14 minutes a day. And we just think of like really nice things. We think of rabbits or snowy, snowy mountains. We get in that Jesus mindset. 
The Bible never talks about getting in the Jesus mindset, right? The Bible talks about believing, repenting, baptism, and receiving the Holy Spirit. There was no name it and claim it. Or uh, would you plant, plant an offering seed this morning? If somebody in the room right now has $10,000, hallelujah, oh wait, I'm feeling, no, I'm feeling 11,000 right now. Someone just found another thousand dollars in their billfold. If you bring that seed here, God's going to turn that to 25 time fold. Hallelujah. Well, glory. I watched a compilation of several, I mean, dozens of preachers going, money, come to me. <laughs> And it wasn't just one preacher. This was like two dozen. It was a compilation. It just had a little clip of each one of these preachers saying that same phrase. What? I'm sorry, but if we look at what Peter's saying in the New Testament, right after Jesus has ascended. Is he talking about all that mess? He says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you. You know, if, if it were true that we could do this, name it and claim it, Lord, every Christian would be a millionaire. Amen. I know a couple Christian millionaires, but they're also pretty smart too. The thing is, God calls us to do things that many of us would find uncomfortable. He calls us to repent. He calls us to truly be sorry for what we've done. You know, sure, I, I, could, I could sit here and list every single thing that the Bible says is not right, but I know that the Holy Spirit is already working on everybody everywhere. He's knocking and he's saying, you know that isn't right what you're doing. You know you shouldn't be doing this. And he puts that conviction on us. Think about something you did this week that you go, mm, you know, that wasn't my best decision. Ooh, I probably shouldn't have said that to that cashier whenever I was at the Dollar Tree. <laughs> mm. We often ignore that still small voice, that Holy Spirit that's tapping us. Look, Peter, he, he doubles down here in, in verse 40 and he, he pleads with them says with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Make yourself different. Let get Jesus in your life. Get this gift of this Holy Spirit so you can think different. You can act different. Please save yourselves. Then he says in 41, look, those who accepted his message Meaning they believed. They accepted and believed. They were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Just one day. Y'all, this is the birth of the church. The church just went from around 120 to 3,120. All in one day. I can go ahead and tell you, I don't know if I'm ready for that blessing to happen to live oak. I don't know where we put them. Upstairs. Upstairs. Yeah, that's, hey, we got a lot of room upstairs. 3,000 in one day. Here's my question. Okay, if that can happen, when's the last time you talked to someone about Christ? I'm not kidding. Let's, let's be for real, for real. When's the last time you were given an opening to talk about your faith? And you just went, ah, you know, I don't, I don't really want to talk about religion. You know, what they say, religion and politics, never bring that up at the family reunion. Shame on us. If 3,000 could be added to their number that day, simply for doing what? Peter is claiming that Jesus is the son of God, that he's the Messiah. And he calls them to repent, be
be baptized and they can have this relationship with him. It's a pretty simple formula. And this is what happened to those that believed. In verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. It says they devoted themselves, devoted. They were all in. They didn't make it secondary. They made it primary. Oftentimes in our culture, church is great and, and it's the thing that we do on Sunday, but I don't really do all the Jesus stuff during the week. You know, I got to go to work and, you know, my, my wife's been aggravating me and I, I ain't worried about, I'll talk to Jesus on Sunday. That's not devotion. That's just a, a neat little hobby that you do on Sundays. They devoted themselves. And look, I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. I'm not an anointed one. Please, woe be it to someone that claims me as any of that. I am a man. However, I am a man that believes fervently in the message that I need to love God. And I need to love my neighbors. I've made it my whole life mission to help others live it out daily. That's now what my life is. It's tough, y'all. Somebody say amen. It's not easy. As a good friend of mine said, you know, being loving to people costs a whole lot of money. That's probably why it's not so popular. This wonderful fellowship that the believers had after Pentecost, look, it wasn't just one dinner. It wasn't just one day a week. It was something that had become ingrained into the way they lived. And that's fellowship. And I'm not saying, look, I'm not trying to guilt trip anybody. Oh, well, if you're not here at the church, you're not fellowshipping. You better be, better be in the house of the Lord on Sunday. You better be in the temple. Guess what? I'm the temple. You're the temple. You're the temple. You're the temple. You're the temple. We need to be temples that are hanging out together. Because if you were a believer, you are the church. If you look over into Corinthians, there's just this wonderful passage with Paul who is talking about the body of Christ. Basically that the hand can't separate itself from the eye. They're both parts of the body, just like we're all parts of the body. We gotta be together. We gotta love on one another. Again, I'm the world's worst about it. If you see me in Walmart, you better make eye contact with me. <laughs> or like holler my name. Please do not get offended if you go, well, I saw Pastor Jordan at Walmart. He didn't say anything to me. I even called his name. If I don't look at you, trust me, I probably didn't see you. And if I didn't look at you, uh, I probably didn't hear you either. Y'all may not realize this, but I'm half deaf. I had, I had a former student of mine. I was in Walmart walking down the aisle and he's going, Mr. J, Mr. J. Mr. James, I didn't, I didn't realize it. And I kept, I just kept hearing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how I hear. <laughs> and I turned around and I was like, I kind of said, I turned around and I was like, Mr. James, I've been calling your name like over and over. He's like, I'm only like 20 feet away from you. He had to come up and touch me. We are to love one another as Christians. We are a family, y'all. In fact, we should be a better functioning family. We should be a family that loves one another. And I know sometimes families can have their spats. We need to be a family that is loving all the time. Look, it says in verse 43, 44, and 45, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Uh-oh, here we go. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone that had need. 
I'm telling you, these early believers, they were living the ideal. You know, I, I will be uh, very forthcoming. If someone came up to me from the congregation and was like, oh, Pastor Jordan, I need $100,000. Could you sell your house? I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, we would have to have a long talk. Like, what's going on? Like, well, uh, is this $100,000, is this life or death? Can we do this in installment payments? <laughs> These early Christians were living in the ideal situation. They were amazed at these signs and wonders that the apostles performed the miraculous healings. They had the power to fight demons the ability to communicate with people that didn't even know their language. You'll notice in the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament that none of the gifts were there to make the apostles seem more than. None of these miraculous gifts were there to make the apostles seem oh so holy. Even though they were in these roles of leadership, the apostles were still humbled down by the power of God. None of them claimed that God had given them a word about how the church was given in tithes. None of them said that God told them that they needed to buy this plane to further the gospel into the far reaches of the world. Everything that the apostles believed in and ultimately died for was the sole purpose, the spreading of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now it says there that the believers, they saw what they had and that everything that they owned was in common. Now look, without getting into politics too much, what I say earlier, not supposed to discuss religion or politics, family reunion, well, we do a little bit of both here. Not to get too deep, but I, I've heard several ministers say that this verse here, verse 44, that this points to communism being the ideal or that socialism, you know, Christian socialism should be the ideal. You know, and uh, by all means, if we could make that work out, if every single person in the community, if they understood Christ is the Lord. If they knew that we are supposed to be good stewards of the land, if they knew that they were supposed to be good stewards of their own money, if we were able to control all of our spending habits, I'm telling you, balancing a checkbook. Does anybody still balance a checkbook? Like actually write it down? Okay. Probably the only person that's... Uh, under 40 that still does that. I do. I, I write it down 14, 15 times because I want to know. You can ask my poor wife. I'm the, the penniest of pinchers or the pincherest of pennies. I, I, I want to make sure every little thing is taken care of. However, if we were in this society where we share everything, does everybody do that well? We know that we should control our spending habits. If we could do that, then yes, Christian communism would be a possibility. However, it's been tried several times in the past and it failed miserably. The one that was doing the work was often mad at the one who was reaping the benefit but not doing as much work. Vice versa, the one who wasn't working was aggravated when the hard worker got on to them. So it was this back and forth. In fact, I did a little bit of study. The early uh, pilgrims, when they came to Jamestown and Plymouth, they tried to do this. And uh, I believe it was in Jamestown. They got there. They're like, fellow brothers and sisters, we are going to share everything. No one will have private land. We will farm together. We will eat together. We will live just like they did at the end of Acts 2. Well, half of them starved that winter. Because one half of the village actually did the work. The other half did the eating. And they said, oh, I can't, I can't do the plow today. I got to do some praying. So I'm going to go pray and you take care of the plow. It's, I got to talk to God. 
It's a good excuse, right? And that's what happened. And that winter, they almost starved to death. Well, in Plymouth, I believe it was in Plymouth, that they decided to do it differently. They said, you know what? Okay, we are all Christians. We all believe we are brothers and sisters in Christ. However, we're going to have individual pieces of property. Guess what? They had an overwhelming amount. And actually, that year at that settlement is where we get Thanksgiving because they had so much extra food. Just makes you question things sometimes. You know, we should work hard. All of us should say yes. Should we be greedy? All of us should say no. Should we give to those in need? Absolutely. Is everyone that asks for something needy? That's the real question. Because I can have $500 in my checking account and then say, hey man, you know, I really want to go get some McDonald's, but I don't have any money. Uh, can I have $20? You don't know what everybody else's checking accounts look like, right? If we were that honest with one another, it would probably work. You know, it, this wasn't like a welfare system in this day and age where you would just get a, a check deposited in your bank account or it would come to you in the mail. You knew who you were helping. And I think that's a big deal. When we talk about being uh, believers and when we talk about going out into the world, loving people, showing them kindness, it shouldn't be a flyby, a, fly, a, a, a drive-by loving. Love needs to be a relationship. You gotta build it with people. And then you help each other in need. The random person, we've had people come up to the church several times where they just walk in, never seen these people, and they immediately, they give this long, long story. You know, oh, we were coming in from California and then the plane exploded. And so we had to walk from Arizona and then we bought a car in Texas and we're on our way back to California. Do you have $50 so we can get gas? Wait, what, what, what are you doing here? Uh, well, uh, we were going to Florida. Oh, okay. And how long have you been here? Oh, uh, we just, we just drove through. I'm like, didn't I see you in the Walmart parking lot last month? Except you didn't come from California. You were coming from Washington State the last time. So <laughs> you need to pick. You going to live on the West Coast or you going to live in Louisiana? This does happen in society. But guess what? We are to show love. But we're to show it more than just giving someone a dollar. Money's nice, but it's not the answer to everything. The folks here in the New Testament, they weren't forced to do this. They weren't forced to sell their things. You'll notice communism, that's something, and socialism, that if you don't pay your taxes, you go to jail, right? These believers loved one another so much that they were just doing this because they thought it was the primary. They were devoting themselves to this. They shared their resources out of love, out of kindness, out of love for one another. Not because they were made to feel guilty. And we find at the end of chapter two here, verse 46 and 47, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They prayed together. They broke bread together. They ate. They spent time together with sincere hearts. You see it says there. And then it says they praised God. And they enjoyed being believers with fellow believers. They didn't do it alone. They didn't keep their hardships hidden behind a closed door because, well, you know, I do, we don't want Martha at church to know that the lights got turned off. She'll judge us. Oh, what? No, don't don't let them know that you 
Don't let them know that the cancer come back because they'll have something to say about it. No, we ain't getting them to pray for you. Oh, well, how would it look? You are not going up to that. Oh, look, I don't care if you got a drug problem. You just going to have to take care of that some other time. We're not going to go and tell nobody in the church that you've been doing drugs. What will they say about us? They didn't put on a show and they didn't try to do it alone. They didn't pretend to be perfect. Instead, they found out how to lean on Christ. They found about the, the power of the Holy Spirit guiding them. Sadly, for years and years, many people have felt ostracized, judged, looked down upon by folks that claim to be good Christians. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that the Bible is just good, that God's just okay with everything that you're doing in your life. Because the Bible isn't good with everything that we're doing. However, the word tells us to grow. Paul would tell Timothy, finish the race. Keep running the race. Folks, we've got to keep running. And in this world, we cannot do it alone. Okay, for my folks that are watching online, technology's been a wonderful thing, but I don't know if you've realized since all this pandemic stuff with the lockdowns and everything, we are communal creatures. Humans like other humans. It is hard to be a good Christian when you don't have your family, your church family supporting you. You going through a rough time? Come talk to somebody and they'll say, I'm struggling with this. Are you? Let's pray together about that. Is there anything I can do to help? This shouldn't be the place that you come and you come, you sit, you leave. Everyone that's in here, you don't even know anybody's name. And the one person you do know their name, you don't like them that much. <laughs> you sat beside them one Sunday and then you decided, nope, next week I'm going to sit on the other side of the church. Oh, I, the view's better over here. <laughs> Y'all, we, just like these early believers, know we might not be all living on a commune like a bunch of hippies from the 60s. That's what I'm thinking when I was reading this. Everyone's just like, yeah, man, it's like, it's so nice. We just, we're going to go eat at Steve's on Monday, and then we're going to Brenda's on Tuesday, man. No, we're not going to live like that in 2022. I, we're not going to go buy a compound and everybody start growing potatoes. But we are going to be a family. We are going to help each other when we need help. We're going to love on each other when we need to be loved on. We're going to pray for one another when we need prayer. That's the best part about going to church. Or at least as I'm reading the scripture... That was the best part for them. It wasn't until us in the present day, we made it into all sorts of other stuff. We are here together. Look, just like Peter said to these Jews when they came to him and they said, brother, what should we do? Y'all as a family, we gotta keep growing. And the easiest way you can ask someone, have you repented? Do you believe? Have you been baptized? Would you like to be baptized? You don't have to be some great theologian to tell somebody about Christ. All you've got to do is tell them how he has blessed you. Amen? Y'all stand with me this morning. God, I'm so thankful for this church family. Again, we, God, I, I'm thankful that you instituted things this way. God, that we are supposed to work together to build one another up. God, and that we're not supposed to keep you a secret. God, that as a, as a body of believers, God, we, we should be going out and telling everybody how good it is to be a believer. And how good it is to have fellowship with other believers, other people that are, are raising you up, that are trying to, to support you. 
It amazes me how many people will go through life in their own little bubble, and that's it. God, teach us to love the world. Teach us to love on them. God, teach us to be able to step outside our comfort zone, to tell someone about you, our wonderful Lord and Savior. God, protect all the people in this congregation. I ask a special blessing on them. Lord, and bring them back next week. We love you. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Love you, my friends. Y'all go have a great week.